Good evening to one and all present here. It gives me immense pleasure to announce today's leadership lecture series by Sri Gita Prasanna. Mr. Prasanna is an Oscar award winning guitarist who is a pioneer in performing Carnatic music on the guitar, an alumnus of IIT Madras and Berkeley College of Music. He is often considered as the quintessential Indian Renaissance man. He was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award for Carnatic music in, th in the year 2006. His passion for music education led him to establish one of the largest colleges of music in South Asia, Sonabhumi Academy of Music in the year 2009. Now, let's welcome Sri Gita Prasanya to the desk. Welcome, sir. I would also like to welcome Pro uh, Dean Iyandar, Mr. Uh, Professor Mahesh, for giving him a, him a token of appreciation. Yes, Good evening to everyone. It's such an awesome trip for me to be back in IIT Madras. As we drove in, I just realized that I haven't come to the campus in about 10 years or so. And it made me feel pretty nostalgic. The last time I was here was to do a TED talk in uh, 2010. Um, and I kept thinking, why I haven't come for so long? So I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here and uh, to be invited to do this. I want to thank uh, uh, Mahesh. I want to thank Lata and everybody else who made this possible. Um, and thank you for coming. So today I wanted to share a little bit about my journey with you. It's been a beautiful journey, um, and IIT Madras has been a very big part of this journey. So let me start from when I was uh, about four to four and a half years old. A very small town called Ranipet. Anybody knows where that is? Yeah? Everybody knows. Yeah. Um, I was, yeah, about four or four and a half years old. Myself and my brother, who's here, uh, Balaji, we were both crazy about guitar because uh, there was a neighbor who was playing guitar. So we had this funny story. Um, both me and uh, Balaji would go to Thiagu, who was the neighbor who was playing guitar in the church, and say, okay, we want to learn guitar. And he said, yeah, buy a guitar and then uh, I'll teach you. We'll come back and relay what, uh, what was told to us, to my dad, who's right here. And he'll say, why don't you learn, and then I'll buy you a guitar. Um, so this kept going on for some time. Um, but what never faded away was the passion to play guitar. And uh, fast forward a year or two later, we moved to Chennai. My dad got a job here at uh, Kotari Madras Limited. Um, and he, he brought this prospectus of a school in Chennai uh, St. John's in Mandavali, and in the prospectus it said guitar class. And I told him, that's the school I want to go to. I didn't care about the academics. I didn't care about anything else. They have a guitar class, and there's a photo of a guy holding a guitar, so I need to go there. And my dad was like, yeah, that's okay, but uh, it's pretty far away from my workplace. I said, I didn't care. We have to do this. So we came. And uh, I got enrolled in St. John's. Lo and behold, I go there. There was no guitar class. <laughs> um, what do I do? I'm not a big fan of dropouts. 
you know i'll come to that a little bit later i wanted to slug it out well no guitar class let's see um i still got to study so started studying there and uh, my patience paid off about 3 years later there uh, i think in my 6th standard there was a guitar class so finally someone was there to teach guitar and i was thrilled so i went for the class there were three students in the class um and i think we had about two or three lessons and then the guitar teacher left i think he moved away to somewhere out of town um but by then i was far too hooked so my dad realized that and uh, he found um one mr shanmugaraj who was uh, also the brother of uh, a family friend and he said okay he's a guitar player and uh, how about you studying with him i said yes so me and uh, my brother we started studying together with uh, shanmugaraj who was my first real guitar teacher um i think a few months down the line it was pretty obvious um who was the most aggressive among the duo of me and my brother uh what happened was i would shut shut the room with a guitar and would never come out <laughs> my brother had very little choice he kept saying why are you always hogging the guitar i need it i need it and i was just too selfish i think uh, that's that's the time i knew that i was just going to be with the guitar all my life um it started in that little room where i used to lock myself up for 6 hours or so my mom tak 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 you know come out you got to eat okay and then go back and you know it was just just too overwhelming uh i just couldn't think of anything else but i was still doing fine in my acads um i was doing fine in school um but i think i think it was a case where that uh, intuition that i had when i was 4 or 4 and 1/2 years old was a real one that i was made to play guitar or the guitar was made for me to play you know for all that passion and all that interest i could have been pretty bad at it you know <laughs> um but it turned out that i was okay um so i started playing and in a few months i was starting to play some concerts here and there and uh and about a uh, few months later uh mr shanmugaraj left i think he got a teaching job in salem and he left and uh then it was back to square one um but right now by this time i was fully into it so then i started studying with uh, a classical guitar player in chennai called samuel tangadurai and very reputed classical guitar player um so he came home and he started teaching me um but he told me something that uh, i never understood but i had to deal with it he said look you don't have nails in your right hand therefore you can't play classical guitar look at this because classical guitar is played with nails right and he was a purist um so i said what do we do he said let's wait till you grow your nails until that time i'll teach you how to read and write music and so my formal education in western music started with him um but 3 months later the nails did not grow i have the habit of taking it out like this or worse like that um he said i don't know what to do <laughs> um and uh, there was a i think there was a series of books that he'd recommended iver myron's graduated guitar course or something uh and he, he you know he's a great guitar player and he was very serious and my dad was like always trying to find out how is how is my son doing he's doing good how is he doing he's doing good one day my dad came and told me enada epoketalu he's doing good on solrare he's not saying anything more than that like are you doing okay i told him yes sir i'm doing fine and then i said well maybe i have to do something spectacular to get something else out of him so one night i went and uh, finished all the three books which is supposed to take 6 months or something according to the books and then the next week he came and i and he said okay let's go from book 1 to book 2 i said no i finished book 3 uh so i played all the stuff and he said you're doing fine but what do we do the nails still haven't grown um anyway that was the end of that session um and then from that point onwards until i went to berkeley college of music i was pretty much self taught on the guitar 
But something interesting happened at that time. My sister, who is here, um, started learning Carnatic vocal. And uh, I started showing interest in just playing that stuff on the guitar. Um, like whatever she was singing, Sarali Varsais or uh, Geetam or whatever it is. I started playing it on the acoustic guitar and um, uh, just kept trying things. And uh, my mom noticed that I'm starting to get interested in that music. Um, and so we were trying to see if uh, my sister's vocal teacher could teach me, um, but that didn't work out. But luckily, uh, my sister was also learning Veena. And um, so we thought, okay, let's approach the Veena teacher. Uh, maybe he'll be more amenable to teaching on the guitar. But uh, he found that a bit scandalous, I guess. Uh, how can you play Carnatic music on the guitar and stuff like that? But my mom was really persistent. She was like, Illala, please give him a chance, you know, check him out. Like, I'm sure he can do well. I'll, he'll find a way to do it. Um, um, but he wasn't convinced. It took a long time. It took about six to seven months. And I have to really uh, thank my mom's persistence for him eventually uh, agreeing, okay, let's do it. So that's the Carnatic journey. It started that way. Um, and I, I was only about 12 years old, so I didn't know what was possible and what was not possible. I only knew that I wanted to do something, I have to do it. You know, I, was, I, I had this uh, resolve inside me that if I want to do something, I want to do it. Not only do it, I want to do it really, really well. So I think that came on early in my, uh, in my life, that uh, go for it spirit. Uh, at that time, I did not realize what was going to happen later and I would turn out this way. I just did it for fun. Um, so I was playing Deep Purple Smoke on the Water one day and uh, one morning and uh, Dikshitar's Maha Ganapatim one evening and in the afternoon it was a Mele Raja song and in the night it was a Led Zeppelin song. It was very unusual. It wasn't unusual for me but for a lot of other people it was like what? Um, so I was playing in a rock band, I was playing in a Tamil film music band, I was starting to do Karnatic Kacheris in small time places. All this was happening and my musical life was really really rich and full and academics was going fine too. So I couldn't have asked for a better life. My dad and mom were extremely supportive of all my, uh, um, my musical trips. And they were extremely supportive about uh, letting me do what I want um, along with the academics. So I grew up in a very, very good family environment where everybody was very supportive. And by then my brother was also very supportive. He, you know, he started singing, so we started doing things together. So music was in the family. Um, there was a lot of music in the family between me, my brother, my sister. Um, but not for a moment I actually thought that I would, I would end up doing music as a career. That was not in my mind at all. All that was in my mind was I want to go to IIT. That's it. I was obsessed with IIT. You know, as obsessed as I was with guitar. And I remember telling my parents, if I don't get into IIT, I'm not going to go to any other college. I'm going to, you know, stay home and try the next year. And then the next year. Um, so, like all good boys, <laughs> by the time I reached my 10th standard, started thinking about JE. And, um, yeah, the whole nine yards, Agarwal, brilliant tutorials, whatever it is, everything in the world. Um, and my life was turning out to be... Uh, Quite interesting. I would be, um, by the time I was in my 10th standard, I, I, I had this band where everybody else was in Loyola College. And uh, so I started playing with that band. It was called the 11th Commandment. Um, and in fact, I had performed in Mardi Gras representing Loyola College when I was in 10th standard. And uh, nobody disqualified me because, you know, there were other bands which brought professional musicians and they say, hey, you, you shouldn't be here. Like, but what do you do with a 10th standard kid? You don't disqualify him, right? So I uh, stealthily sneaked in as a Loyola College uh, <laughs> band member when I was still in my 10th standard. And uh, it didn't stop with uh, Mardi Gras. 
I went all over uh, to Bangalore, to Bombay, to Delhi, all these places. And it, uh, it used to be funny. Like I would come back from some place and uh, come back home at 10 or 11 in the night. And then I'll sit with my agarwal and, you know, all that stuff. Um, so it was, it was a lot of hard work. But one thing I want to stress is when you're really having fun, it doesn't seem like it's work, right? I was really enjoying academics. I, I love math. I loved physics. I loved English. I loved everything. Uh, I loved playing guitar. I loved Carnatic music, jazz, rock, everything. What's my problem? So what if I work really hard? It's, it's totally fine. Um, so this is how it went. And then one fine day I uh, got through JE and I was just telling Mahesh this uh, very interesting story. Thank God I came to IIT Madras. If I didn't come to IIT Madras, I would have never become a professional musician. I'll say that again. If I did not go to IIT Madras, I would have never become a professional musician. So here's the story. 1988 JE, uh, no, 1987 JE, whatever. There was one physics problem on electromagnetic, electromagnetic induction or something. Something of the nature of what I had solved a lot in my classes with uh, Professor Balasubramaniam and all that. And I got obsessed with solving that particular problem and uh, I didn't realize time flew and uh, by the end of it I had only attempted about 50% uh, of the physics paper. I still got through JE. And when I did get through JE, I had a choice, either to study aerospace in uh, uh, Mumbai or something else in Karakpur or civil or naval architecture in Chennai. I told my parents, I want to be in Chennai because I don't want my Carnatic music training with my guru Tiruvarur Balasubramaniam to get affected. So that was the reason I stayed in Chennai. And I was not interested in civil. I knew nothing about naval architecture except that it sounded cool, right? It sounded cool, yeah. Go tell anyone, naval architecture, wow. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'll go for naval architecture and didn't realize that it involved a lot of drawing <laughs> and engineering, uh, and both of which, uh, you know, I was not exactly really into. I was more of a math physics type guy. I didn't realize that engineering was way too much engineering for me and uh, way too much uh, drawing for me. And somehow I was like, well, hmm, okay, let's see how this pans out. And then enter Professor Dr. Ellis Ganesh. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but he's a phenomenal singer. He's, he's a really, really great singer. And uh, we started developing a very close bond. And he would come out and give me a lot of cassettes and say, like, let's try this with the IIT band. And he would come and guest with us. Um, and... Uh, Sometime in my third year or so, he came home one day. I can never forget that. He came home and told my parents, I don't think your family needs an engineer. Please let him do music. I don't know if that was his exact words, but that was the import of what he said. Uh, that half an hour discussion he had with my parents, for which I'm deeply thankful, made my parents feel very comfortable. Um, that an IIT professor has come home <laughs> and he said this, okay. Um, I thank God and uh, thank uh, Dr. Ganesh. I don't know how, how good an engineer I would have turned out to be. When I, uh, when I did uh, my, one of my, I think my final project, I, I had to design a SWAT ferry or something like that. And uh, my center of gravity came negative. And I knew right there, I knew right there and then uh, there was the standing joke in my naval arc batch. You know, I designed a propeller and like instead of 28 feet, it was 28 meters or something like that. And everybody started laughing and like, yes, I need all these failures. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was convinced. Come on, who wants center of gravity to be negative in your ship, right? Not me, not anyone. So I took Dr. Ganesh's word and realized that this family does not need another engineer. Um, and uh, I set my sights on Berklee College of Music. Um, a lot of my, my heroes and idols, I was very big into this band called Steely Dan. I still am. Just the fact that Donald Fagan went to Berkeley or Aldi Miola went to Berkeley or John Schofield went to Berkeley, I was just obsessed. Wow, this is the place I need to go. I need to, I need to get out of here and like, this, there's a whole another world out there. Um, and it was also... Um, 
a decision that I had to make internally for myself because this was really starting to play in to my psyche. Why am I playing jazz? Why am I playing rock? Why am I playing metal? Why am I playing Carnatic? All of it at the same time. Uh, either I'm crazy or maybe I have a vision. I have to figure that out. So I started bringing all these things together when I was in IIT. IIT was my my home ground for all my experimentation. So with uh, my bands uh, from IIT, I started composing my own original material where I would start integrating these Carnatic ragas with rock and jazz and all that stuff and uh, uh, won a lot of these competitions which gave me that boost uh, that yes, I could do all these things. When a lot of other bands were playing uh, deep purple covers and stuff like that. I was doing my own stuff. So I just looked at everything like a laboratory, started experimenting uh, with what I have, trying to bring all these aspects of myself together because I really believed in my own core. I really believed that my core is is something unique. I just have to find it. I knew I had a calling. I knew I had a voice, but I had to find it. And I needed... Um, an education to find it and that's why I chose to go to Berkeley College of Music but somewhere along the way another funny incident happened one day a batchmate of mine um, said hey there is a there's an offshore job uh, for which there's an interview I'm going for it you know why don't you also come I said what offshore job so we all thought like offshore drilling or something like that I went for the interview turned out to be an offshore IT job <laughs> and uh, and as it turned out, I got the job. And I was thinking, what am I going to do? I had never even gone to a, you know, at that time it used to be called CC, you know, the computer center in IIT. Uh, I had never even gone there, um, except for like some very basic Fortran stuff that I had to do. Um, I didn't know anything about computers. And here am I with, a, with an IT job. So well, my thought was, well, this is the only job in which I don't have to do much and I can still practice my music. So. Let's do it. <laughs> so I joined this company, uh, which is now called Covansys. At the time, it was called Complete Business Solutions. I joined them and uh, worked for about a year and a half. Um, and I was on what is called bench, right? Where uh, one day you're supposed to get a job in the US, get your H1 and go. Uh, so a lot of my friends who were my colleagues who were working with me kept leaving. And I knew my turn was going to come. And suddenly, some epiphanic thing struck me in my head. I said, I can't do this. This is not real. I don't want to go to the US and take a software job. That's not what I'm cut out for. And if I start doing it, then I'll get too comfortable with it and too cozy with it. I'll never go to Berkeley College of Music. So I don't know what got into me. I came home one day and I told my dad and mom, Appa I'm, and Amma, I'm going to quit tomorrow. I want to go to Berkeley in another three months. And they said, yes. They didn't ask me any questions. So I did that. I quit my job for no particular reason <laughs> except that I'm done with it. And uh, yeah, my new life started. A few months later, I did go to Berkeley, uh, but I did not realize what what was coming. When I went to Berkeley, I realized that there were hardly anybody from India. And most people who had gone from India, I don't know, lasted three months, six months, and then moved. Um, I didn't know why. Was it the competition? Was it the weather? I don't know. I went there and I found out that I was one among 1,000 guitar students. 1,000 guitar students in the college. I was just one among them. And the reality dawned on me that I play an instrument which is played by hundreds of millions of people, or I don't know, hundreds of millions, but definitely close to it, right? I think the guitar, one out of six musicians in this world definitely play guitar. Am I right? Probably two. Everybody has played the guitar at some point in their lives. It's, it looks like, right? And here I am, you know, trying to figure out how I can distinguish myself on an instrument which hundreds of millions of people play and I come to this school and there are 1,000 guitar players. There were only 17 trombone players in the school. There were four violin players and there were 1,000 guitar players. 
and it just struck me what have i done i am now entering into the most competitive domain that i could think of i'm playing an instrument which every tom dick and harry and their tom dick and harry's brother plays and uh, and i i felt that responsibility am i doing the right thing to myself for the trust that uh, my parents and my family uh, gave me i started working very hard of course um, but also along with it i knew something that i wanted to be my own guy i want to develop my own individual voice i don't want to sound like jimmy page i don't want to sound like uh, pat metheny i don't want to sound like anybody that i had very very early in so with when my students uh, friends and when we used to chat and like they hey man like you know man, i really want to play like joe satriani and somebody will come and say like you know man that steve vai is so cool man i want to play like steve vai i would tell them why do you want to play like steve vai you're going to be a very poor imitation of him why don't you play like yourself and people like what do you mean and i realized that that is my call that is the voice that is my distinguishing factor to sound like myself right and i looked back and said that i was doing that anyway so what is that myself my roots carnatic music right the culture that i come from now took a very important part in my life i started teaching myself carnatic singing on my own because i had to explain to people that what i do there oh, is not some weird bizarre technique it's a vocabulary it's a cultural vocabulary you know because they they've never heard anything like that played on the guitar so when when i do all these carnatic gamakas it would sound like it's some some crazy stuff and i i told myself no they need to know it's not crazy stuff it's actually vocabulary it's actually something that's been there for hundreds of years and what i play is exactly like the way somebody sings therefore i started singing more before that i was singing rush and led zeppelin but now i started singing carnatic also then i started teaching as soon as i became a student in berkeley i had a lot of students and a lot of berkeley faculty were studying with me and we made like these immense deals you teach me carnatic music and i'll teach you a little bit of harmony so that you can test out of this course and move to the next course you know so i worked out all these nice deals with different faculty and um, and the time in berkeley was so amazing i got to see so many musicians i i was able to challenge myself um uh, it was really incredible but it was also a situation where not everybody was comfortable with that level of experimentation that i was doing you know just like how a lot of classical uh, musicians in india are pretty uptight about their own tradition so is the same with jazz so is the same with classical music in the west there would be people like oh this is a miles davis tune what are you doing with your indian ragas here and sometimes i would get bad grades because i was too creative <laughs> uh and then i knew i was on to something i knew if so many people hate what i do that means i must be doing something really well you know um there must be something to it it's starting to affect them that means there must be a whole another side of people who are going to love it so i kept going i kept going for it i kept saying this is my voice this is my voice i got to bring in my roots into everything that i do and um, yeah and then as it turned out turned out to be a good thing so that is my journey and after that it's all i guess a continuation of that um and here i am about uh 26 years after i graduated from iit madras and uh yeah i'm happy that i'm here to tell a tale and a story that uh, hopefully resonates with you uh i have to say one thing even though i'm not pursuing uh engineering as a career or anything like that i have to say that my time at iit madras and the fact that i went here has has been a very big part of a uh, very big part of my life and it has given me a lot um and when i started swarnabhumi academy of music here um apart from my uh carnatic one on training with uh, kumari a kanya kumari which which has been a great blessing for me for many many years getting an education from two top flight colleges 
like IIT Madras and Berkeley College of Music had given me a unique perspective, uh, one in technical education and the other in, in the arts. And in, in conjunction with uh, our own Guru Sishya model of learning, I had these three streams of education that, uh, that became a crucial part of my life and uh, started defining who I was. And I implemented all the three when Sam started where we created a Gurukula system of learning where faculty from different countries come and live with the students. Uh, and I was able to design a curriculum that actually reflected all the things that I've been doing. And, um, and I was able to give back to this city that has given me a lot. So it's, it's a nice full circle. And I don't know where this journey is going to lead me from now on. But uh, all I can say is I'm uh, immensely happy for how it has turned out. There are so many people along the way who have supported me. My wife, Shalini, who is also an IIT Madras alumnus, uh, has been a great pillar of support for me. And uh, she still sings with uh, my band. She's a phenomenal singer. Um, my family, uh, my parents, my brother, sister, um, they've all been amazingly supportive. My friends, my fans. Um, so I can't ask for a better life. So this is my journey, a journey of gratitude. Thank you. Um, okay, part B of what I wanted to talk to you is how, what is the process of succeeding as an artist, right? Um, Many of us think that it's all purely merit, but this is not sports. It's not that the best batsman gets the best recognition. This is not a case where if you're Roger Federer, you will be the most famous tennis player in the world. No. That's a harsh reality I came to know much later. There are so many guitar players who know only three chords and make millions of dollars three chords that any 13 year old could have learned in four days and make millions of dollars and are superstars. And then there are people who are a repository of knowledge, who have such an immense vocabulary in music. They've done a PhD, whatever it is, whatever it is, and struggling to make a living. Think about that. That doesn't happen in sports. That doesn't happen in business. That doesn't happen in academia. The more papers you write, I'm sure, the more you will know, be known in your field. So this part of it, I didn't know. I thought you play guitar well and your life is made. Wow, how wrong. Why no? Do Sorry? Why do you feel it's not possible? There's no part of you between real talent and real success. I don't know, frankly. I don't know why it happens, but I can tell you one thing. I can tell you that it's not sport because when Sachin Tendulkar plays so beautifully, people who don't know cricket can still objectively see that he's playing beautifully. When a, when a, f sorry? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that at all levels, you could see when a sportsman or a sportswoman does something, you can, you, there is a bar by which you can clearly see it. But because of the subjectivity of arts, right, it's hard to place it in an objective spectrum, right? Because unlike sports, here you're dealing with you're dealing with a transfer of feelings between the artist and the fan, right? And that makes it extremely subjective, extremely subjective. Music itself is objective, right? Because it's also a science. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't even know that music is a science don't even know that you probably will be better off with an education in music. 
because the glamour story is the typical rags to riches story. This dude from the street, totally uneducated, did not go to school, did not go to college, and makes music like a dream. Therefore, we don't need to go to college. I had to deal with these kind of um, blocks from a lot of people when, when, when I was president of this college, and I realized, wow, people know so little about the process, right? Anyway, my point was that I wanted to give you an insight into how I started thinking about these things. One of the things that I did early on in my life um, is to surround myself a lot with non-musicians. Surround myself with friends who are lawyers, businessmen, engineers, whatever. And luckily, my IIT network already did that to me, right? So if I'm in a party, there's like a lawyer, there's an engineer, there's a uh, research scientist, there's, you know, unlike a lot of other artists, I didn't search only for my own ilk as my company. I did that deliberately because I wanted perspective. I knew I was good at music, but that doesn't mean anything. I can learn from anybody else, right? So I developed a friend circle. I developed a network of people from all walks of life. That gave me a lot of perspective in how to handle a situation like this. And I was also clear about one thing. I have a direct connection with the people who listen to my music. So if I work on that, if I work on myself to be a connecting force and make my music a bigger vehicle than just the music, in other words, start looking at music as a vehicle for connecting with people and see how I could do that, how I could become a bridge between the past and present, how I could become a bridge between the present and the future, right? Be how I can become a bridge between this left camp and the right camp, right? Left camp, let's say, is saying like, you can experiment with all music, right camp saying, you should leave Carnatic music alone. How can you tamper with Sahana Raga, right? How can you break tradition? You're hearing all these voices in your head, right? The rock and roll world is cool with everything, but the Carnatic world may not be, but I need to be a bridge. I need to keep those Carnatic world as my friends. I need to keep this rock and roll world as my friends. So I learned to be empathetic to all these schools of thought and yet develop my own school of thought that doesn't reject anything, but at the same time, does not take everything in its face value. And it's easier said than done, you know? So I have these, what I call E-values for the long-term success uh, of an artist. One, to entertain. The primary function of an artist is to entertain. Some artists hate the word entertain. How can you call what I do as entertainment? It is art. Whether you call it art or entertainment, it doesn't matter ultimately, right? Once you are a public per uh, perform, uh, performer, you are an entertainer. It doesn't mean like, you know, I have to wear Hendrix clothes every time, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. But you have to be aware that you are playing in front of people. You're playing for them. These people have spent two hours of their time to come to your concert. It's not your job to just like show your back and play like this or like, you know, act as if you're not concerned about them. No, you got to present what you do well. Therefore, you need to learn how to present your music. It's not enough to just play your music well. So I tell myself, do not ever get into a shell and forget or be unmindful of who's sitting and listening to you. Find a way to connect to them, which is defined what I play. Right? And then the other word which I really love is enigma. You know, for you to keep moving ahead, you want to make sure that nobody can put a finger on what exactly you are. When they're trying to figure you out, you move on to something else. Or in other words, you have to constantly reinvent yourself. So if I played X kind of music 
five years back, I should be very, very different today because there's so much happening around me. I have to absorb what's going on around me. I have to reconnect my world with that and reinvent myself, right? So I always tell myself, am I enigmatic? For example, I'll give you a real example. Let's say I play a, a Carnatic song or whatever it is. Just when I realize that it's getting to be too much in that direction, I might take it in another direction. And then I would bring it back in another direction. I would constantly play this game with myself. And uh, now it has become a part of what I do. So maintaining an enigmatic personality in your work actually helps a lot because you don't want people to figure you out that quickly. How are you going to last for the next 40, 50 years? Right? So you need to have that, that, that little click in your head. Well, I've done this for too long. I got to move on. I got to move on. Right? And then, of course, education. Very, very important. You got to constantly educate yourself with what's going on. Right? And then emote. Unlike in any other field, the first thing that a listener or a fan looks for is is the artist revealing himself or herself to you right they want to see that they want to see that you're able to emote to them because you're going to touch them only on the basis of that you're not going to touch them on the basis of mathematical logic you can't say my music has got all these great fancy stuff why don't you like it somebody can just say i don't like it because it doesn't sound good to me whereas in the other way if you are able to emote well and if you are able to connect with people very well you can play the most complex music on earth and people would love it take ele raja for an example what ele raja does is extremely complex stuff but everybody is able to enjoy it right so therefore you have to find that emotional connecting factor it's especially true it may not be true in some other professions because it's not a direct correlation with your audience but here it is and that's where some of the wise cracks miss out on. That's where the people who do all the technical stuff very well, they can do all that stuff, but nobody connects with them. So you have to be very mindful of that. And the other word is enterprising. You have to be enterprising. You have to come out with new initiatives. You have to be willing to form new uh, relationships, new bands, new collaborative projects. You need to find the dude in Africa and say, hey man, I can connect with you, right? I, I find that. I could do this. I could. So early on, I started pairing my bands with multicultural identities. Almost every time I play, like the bass player will be from uh, Sweden, the drummer will be from Suriname, or whatever it is. It's like it gives me that that zing, that yes, you can you can bring people of different cultures together and uh, you know create an initiative and then the last one is evolution you have to constantly evolve right you can't be a dinosaur in this world today right that's that's the problem with a lot of classical musicians they really miss out on the exploratory opportunities and then they complain oh i've been doing so well nobody comes for my shows why will they come you're not relevant anymore so you got to be relevant that's the big challenge of staying uh, the course as an artist today to stay relevant and that is uh, a tremendous challenge and the only way you can measure up to that is to evolve you have to constantly evolve and all these things that I talked about come on is it only specific to art no right these are basic life skills any profession that you are in you have to do this except that in this particular case I have looked at all these things as a mantra. And many times what I do is I just write random words beginning in C, right? I need inspiration all the time. So I would say, like, write words in C. Compassion. Uh, tell me another good, nice word in C. Confidence, right? If I write something in I, imagination, intuition, IIT, imagination, intuition, and technique. Right? So stuff like this that I always look, I write things down sometimes and, and just say, okay, I'll go for that. Because to me, it's all about putting words into action. Right? Because when you play music, the communication is nonverbal. 
if you are not able to connect with your audience, it doesn't matter how well you describe what you play, it's not going to work. If you are able to connect with your audience, you may have zero uh, you know, articulation skills and yet you win. So it's a, it's a, it's a funny world, but, but I'm also a teacher. I also teach a lot of people. So I can't just, uh, just make what I look like some mystical thing. I have to break down the process. I have to get results of other people, results from other people, right? So it's important that whatever you're saying, you're able to put into action. And to me, that is what is leadership. It's a state of mind. And uh, you, you have to exercise leadership in everything that you do. For example, how many people know exactly what a band leader does? Everybody knows what a corporate leader does, right? So let's say I, I, uh, let's say I play a concert here tomorrow with my five-piece band, right? How do I get them to play well? A lot of people don't know. It's not just the music. What if I had only one day of rehearsal? What if I had only two hours of rehearsal? I did a show in Hyderabad the uh, day before yesterday with a band where like we were playing pretty complex music and we did not rehearse at all, but all the music was sent to them. I made sure everything was clear. Uh, I made sure when we got together, we, we knew exactly what to do, right? So there are lots of skills involved here that are the same leaderships that you would need, need uh, leadership skills that you would need in doing anything well. If you need to get a bunch of people together and create an initiative and uh, turn that into a great thing, uh, that is one amazing thing that A.R. Rahman does. He's a great leader, especially for that, because he picks people that you would never expect, right, and turns it into gold. Right, singers that you would never expect to come and sing in a Tamil song, whatever it is. So all these basic things that we are talking about in entrepreneurship, in leadership, all of this apply to music. And the artists who are able to exercise those skills are the ones who actually go far, not necessarily the ones who play well. Let me say that again. Not necessarily the ones who play that well. It doesn't mean you should not play well. I mean, you can't aspire to not play well. That's, that's a no-no, right? But the point here is that you have to proportion your time to learn multiple skills that you have to constantly be exercising to be successful. And I just wanted to let that come across here in my talk because I don't want anybody to be under this illusion that artists just spring up from the sky, their music just comes from heaven and like, you know, and they're like nobody else. No, we're just like normal people who are struggling to figure out how to make it work, right? So it's not different from any other uh, industry. There is one thing about playing very well, there's one thing about excelling at what you do, but there's a whole another thing called success. And you'll have to define it along the way as it goes. To me, you're successful, number one, if you're doing what you love. That's the first step, doing what you love. And there is no point in doing music if it is not what you love. Nobody ever goes to a music school because you know they're gonna get a great job. Never. They go only because they're so passionate towards music, right? So there is no there is no veil here. You have to go in with full passion, but you also have to avoid this trap that just because you're good and just because you practice the world is going to like take you, no, you have to fight it out. So, so I look to sportsmen and sportswomen as inspiration because you can clearly see how they, they put a fight and the sportive nature, if they lose a game, they're like, well, the other party played well, therefore I lost. Next time I'm going to do better. Whereas artists are like, if you, if you do a show badly, oh, my god like you know i don't know what happened like you know i didn't play my best and this and that and you know constantly whining and here's another thing which happens to artists a lot somebody comes and tells you hey you played very well and then you know and then i say no i don't think i played that well these are like things that you should never say you know even if you feel that you could have done better 
That's not what you should tell that person who really believed that you played beautifully, right? So we don't realize all these things and all these things matter. And then what happens? That person is never going to be your friend. He's going on. Oh, he's, he's way beyond me, pa. Right? That's not how it is. You're not able to endear to that person, right? Obviously, you played very well. Otherwise, that person wouldn't have come and told you. So these are things. It's like this constant uh, interaction between your fans, you, between your friends. Um, that makes this a very enriching life. One of the things that I, as an artist, can see is the direct effect of what I do on people. And that is truly amazing. The other day, uh, um, this, this person who's, a, who's an entrepreneur in Texas, he bought a CD of mine. He loved it so much. And then one day he wrote to me saying like, you know, before I go to my board meetings, I listen to this CD and it keeps me like, you know, totally energized. I seem to have a great day. And in another situation, I gave one of my CDs when my daughter was about seven months old. And in a daycare, I just gave the CD of mine called Peaceful that I had done long back um, to the daycare people and said like, you know, keep this. And in the evening when I went to pick her up, they said, all the kids slept very well today. I don't know what it was in the music. Can you bring me all your other CDs? And I was really touched because that CD was not for kids. It had crazy stuff. I mean, it had like complex music, but it worked. So uh, when I wrote this song, Bowling for Peace, um, uh, when it came out on my album, Electric Ganesha, and a lot of people wrote to me saying it is now used as a theme song for the blind school uh, of dance in Calcutta. It's used as a theme song for a, uh, for a road cleaning project in Bangalore when they did a video. It's used in so many places. It, it has, that's not the imagery that I had when I composed the song, but it, it meant so many different things to so many people. And these are things that make uh, my life truly enriching because uh, there, is, there is no substitute to that. You can actually see transformation happen and therefore uh, to be an artist and to be connected with society and to be a part of people's lives is a tremendous blessing uh, and that in itself will take care of negating all the struggles and all the other trials and tribulations that that come with being an artist um, and uh, makes it very rewarding. So that's in a nutshell <laughs> about what it is to be who I am. Thank you. I don't know how we are doing on time, but um, can I? I'm happy to answer a few questions briefly. I hope so, because one of my incredible piano students is an autistic boy. Um, and uh, I've learned a lot about autism, um, you know, by interacting with him. Yes, I don't know about cure, but make a difference. I hope so. Yes, yes. I don't know. I don't know, but I should. Uh, I did a workshop for uh, um, the blind school in Mumbai once uh, a few years back. And uh, it was such a beautiful experience. We were all sitting and playing uh, some beautiful things together. Um, yes, I think music is a great healing force, uh, for sure. That's why everybody Everybody has a very special place for music in their hearts. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, he's asking about me leaving the job and going for my music and was it just intuition? No. I think I subconsciously knew that I was an outlier. I knew that I was an out-of-the-box person. Everything that I have done in some way, right? Playing Carnatic music on the guitar, going to IIT, and then going to Berklee College of Music, and then doing all the crazy things that I do. Uh, I knew that I'm not wired to just, just uh, 
just exist i had to make a life of my own i knew that i have to find my own voice and i couldn't think of anything else except music in which i could find my voice that's why i left my job yeah exactly that's that is what i said when i composed bowling for peace i just composed it like a little prayer for myself but people see other other uh, things associated with it yes so see the, the 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 beauty about art is that it's both subjective and objective uh the beauty about music is it's both an art and a science in fact i would add a third element to it it's an art science and a language right therefore because it's a language it can be spoken it can be written and it can be communicated across cultures because it's art it need not be talked about it can move from soul to soul and because it's a science you can appreciate it after the fact that you've loved it right like yesterday i was in hyderabad airport and i was really sick of whatever music that was being played in the lounge uh because for 3 hours i was enduring the same thing whatever it was i have nothing bad to say but it's just that i was bored so i put the headphones on and started listening to one of my favorite songs by yes called close to the edge you know it which is a work of spiritual art it's like it draw it drew me in a whole another world and i needed that i desperately needed that at that moment and then i was fine so it means different things to different people and uh, you cannot um so in that sense it's subjective but it's also objective because that music did involve a lot of intellect and rigor that i personally enjoy since we are short on time we'll have only one more question so there's a difference in the music whether the art is being i don't know i well no i'm i'm really open about it uh, two days back in an interview in hyderabad somebody was asking me what are you really into i said i don't know right now I said, well, and then i thought about it and said like electronic dance music i listen to like underground uh, electronica f- from like dj's and all that stuff you know, who knows i don't do that but it goes into my bank somewhere maybe we can take one more question yes yes a lot of my students one of them is right there <laughs> um a lot of my students play a lot of young kids uh they and uh, and people like she there yeah they do they're doing great uh, yeah it's doing fine yeah everybody plays with a normal guitar no it's fine as it is yeah anything else anybody all right shall we finish with these two thanks can you speak up a little bit can you just paraphrase your question a little differently who told you that sorry normal then the ones who like jazz or paranormal Well you're getting at an interesting question. I'll just talk about something else here. 
which I was telling this uh, journalist the other day and she was stunned when I said this. See, when Mozart or uh, Charlie Parker or uh, Allman Brothers Band or Elay Raja composed their music, they thought about it as being a timeless work. They wanted it to be heard 30 years from now, 40 years from now, in Mozart's case, probably 200 years from now. But today's pop artists don't think like that. They deliberately avoid timelessness. They don't care if their music is heard one year from now. They want it to be heard now. And one year from now, they may be working as carpenters. They don't care. It was never like that in the history of music. That is the reason why when you hear today's pop music and you say, oh, it's not like that 80s song. You still remember Hotel California. Hotel California was made to be timeless. Right? But the X artist or the Y artist who is doing Gen X pop knows very well that she doesn't have to be timeless. She is living in a world of instant gratification. As long as the YouTube hits bring in the moolah in the first six months, she's on to something else. You don't have to listen to that song again. Are you really thinking that Rihanna wants to be timeless like Mozart? So therefore, it's our inadequacy to blame Rihanna for not doing a song which you will remember 30 years from now. That's not her point at all. Right? Just like how we want, like, you know, when somebody, when you see that blue thing in WhatsApp and, like, that person hasn't responded to you, you're thinking, oh, my God, like, what does he think of me? Ooh, whatever it is. Maybe the person just, like, you know, I mean, is driving. So in a world of instant gratification, uh, it's different. But, but having said that, there are also uh, art forms like jazz or Carnatic music or uh, any of these which will continue to thrive as long as it stays relevant. So to my students, I tell them, Carnatic concerts, right? Don't sit there and blank like this. Try to engage the audience. Say hello. How often do you hear a Carnatic concert where someone says good evening? Very rarely. Very rarely. That's outrageous. You got to show people that you're there for them. Make subtle differences in the performance practice. And then Carnatic concerts or even in jazz, right? They choose like five songs. Uh, let's say Carnatic. One song is in Todi. By the time you got out of Todi mood, one song is in Subapanturali. Oh my God. By the time you got out of Subapanturali, one song is in Mohanam. Suddenly you're jumping with joy. And your joy is for two minutes. And then suddenly like uh, something in Mukari comes. And then suddenly, what is this? It's like trying to eat pasta and vada and like salad and, uh, uh, you know, ravioli and falafel at the same time. Come on, people will break off. This is not how it's supposed to be. This is what I mean by not being relevant. Carnatic music will no longer be relevant if you do these things. Oh, in 1940, Arya Kudi sang Todi and after that he sang Kamboji, so it's okay. Come on, give me a break. In my December Kacheris, I play Stairway to Heaven. Nobody knows that it is Stairway to Heaven. The mamas and mommies are like, huh, and the part Roman and this, sir. So the other guys like know that, man, this dude played Stairway to Heaven in a Karnati Kacheri, in a Sabha Kacheri. Suddenly I play an Ilay Raja song, which transformed into a Led Zeppelin song, and then suddenly becomes a Dikshitar song. People love it. Right? So I told you I'm an outlier. So I always think. But I always think in favor of being, yeah, and I always think in favor of being relevant, right? So there will be art forms like jazz, Carnatic music, which require, which involve education, study, deep work, will thrive because they're just great. But don't expect, I don't expect my song to be heard 30 years from now. I have no illusions about that. I'm happy if people love it today. Right? Therefore, I can make music that works for me and for everyone. If they listen to it 20 years from now, great. But that's not the thing. So being relevant is also being current and staying in shape. Right? Shall we close with that? I hope that was relevant. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir, for those amazing words. It was really an inspiration for all of us. With this, we are concluding to desktop.